Section 14.1 covers functions of several variables. In this section, we want to understand the definition of a function in two or more variables and how to find the domain of that function. And then we also want to know what a level curve is and how we can use that to help us graph functions and how it relates to the graph of that function. Before we get into that, let's go talk a little bit more about planes and sort of how they can interact with each other. And that'll help us uh, really get a better picture of sort of how these planes work and be able to picture them in space. So let's assume, assume we have planes, two different planes, and we want to know about their possible intersections. So if I think about it, if I have two different planes in space, I'll try to draw my best picture of these, maybe those planes are just parallel to each other so that they never intersect. Or if they do intersect, they're going to run one right into the other one and they're going to intersect in some line. So if I have two planes, either they intersect in a line or there's no intersection. The only way they can have no intersection is if they're parallel, which means they have parallel normal vectors or their normal vectors are scalar multiples of each other. Now if I have three planes, the situation could be a little bit different. I could have a point where all three come together. I can have a line where all three come together, or I can have no intersection. So I give, encourage you to take a couple seconds and think about what all of those situations would look like. And I'll go ahead and pull in a picture here. All right, I just pulled it in more than once. So let's get rid of the extra copy there. Okay, right, so what's that gonna look like? In order to get a single point, I basically want to have my two line, my two planes, each intersecting in their own line of intersection. And then the point where those two lines come together will give me that single point of intersection. If each pair intersects along the same line, then my intersection could be just that single line. And then I can get no intersection lots of different ways. I could have each one pairwise intersect in a single line, but then none of them go in the common for the same line. I could have two of the pairs parallel, so I get two different lines of intersection. Or I could write also just have all three planes parallel to each other, stacked up on top of each other, so that way I get no intersection. So there's lots of different ways to do that. Okay, that's sort of a follow-up to that question to that. What are some of the ways that we can uniquely define a plane? We've seen that if you have three points, then I can get my two normal vectors. Once I have those two normal vectors, we take the cross product to find that, sorry. I have three points, I find the two vectors in the plane. Once I have those two vectors in the plane, I take the cross product to get the normal vector. And then that's going to uniquely de determine my plane. So if I have three points, that uniquely determines a plane as long as they're not collinear. So if they happen to be all on the same line, then, right, if I just have three points that are in the same line, I can kind of picture this picture up in the corner here. So I'm looking at this picture in the corner. If I just have a single line, there's a whole bunch of different planes that I'll go through that line. So we could have multiple planes through those three points if they're all on the same line. Now, what else do we have, right? The sort of the basic thing is a point and a normal vector. That normal vector has to be non-zero. In the situation above, if we did have collinear points, my two vectors in the plane would be parallel to each other. You take the cross product of parallel vectors, you get a zero vector as your normal vector. And that's how we could kind of see algebraically that that was gonna be bad. What else is going to uniquely determine a plane? I could have two vectors in the plane and a single point that's on that plane. And so if I have some point, I know this vector is in the plane, I know this vector is in the plane, that's going to uniquely determine my plane. And finally, I can have a point and a line. And I need that point to be not on the line. 
right? Because if the point was on the line, it's the same as having those three collinear points. But if I have a point and a line, then I can always get three points from that. And once I know I can get three points, then I can have my unique plane. All right, last two questions here, just to kind of recap all of the stuff we've seen before. What does the graph of f of x equal 1 look like if I'm in R2? Right, in R2, f of x equals 1, my function, value, oops, drew it the wrong way, sorry about that, let's try again. f of x, the function value, is always 1, so that's going to be a line. But now here I'm thinking of this as sort of a z equals 1. So that's going to be a plane in R3. So again, we get these different shapes based on the dimension. OK, so now we're ready to get into this 14.1 stuff. Again, we're thinking about functions of several variables. So I'm allowed to have both x and y as my variables here. And I want to think about what the graph of this is going to look like. Because I'm allowed to have both an x and a y, my input's going to be sort of in two dimensions. So for maybe we let x equal 1 and y equals 0. So I'm going to go out to x equals 1 and y equals 0. I plug that in. f of 1 comma 0 is 1 times 0 plus 3 times 1. So that's 3. So at that point, my function value is 3. So I go up to a z value of 3. And that's a point that's going to be on my graph. Let's actually keep the colors consistent here. So that's the point on that graph. Now we can pick a new x value. x equals 2, y equals 1. So I go to the point 2, 1 in space. I plug that into my function, f of 2 comma 1 is equal to 2 times 1 plus 3 times 2. So that's going to be 2 and 6 is 8. And now I have to go up to a function value of 8. So we'll go all the way up here. Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then that's a point on my graph. So I want to make sure I do this for every single point on that graph. So let's go ahead and put this into GeoGebra to see what that's going to look like. So we can go ahead and put this function into GeoGebra. So you can either put it in as a z equals or an f of x, y equals. So let's put it in as an f of x, y. Oops, got the wrong symbol there. Fix that x comma y. And we'll say that that is equal to our x times y plus 3x. And we can see the shape that we get for this graph, right? So for each point in the xy plane, I'm going to evaluate the function. That gives me a z value, and I plot that xyz point. So we can see or, for example, plotting the points 1, comma, 0, comma, and we plug in 1 and 0, we got that 3. So that is that point there on the graph that we had tried to draw. And then, for example, we also had that other point 2, comma, 1. And if we plug 2, 1 in, we got 2 plus 6 was 8. So that was another point on our graph. I can also enter this as, say, let's make a new point, 0, comma, 3, comma, and then I can write f of 0, comma, 3. And then it will evaluate that function for me and put that point on the graph. So there's that point C down there. OK, so I'm just going to spin this around so I have the positive axes in the right spot. And then we'll pop this graph into our uh, slides. Let's look at some graphs we've seen before. So if we have f of x, y, right, we're thinking of this as our z equals. I have that 
as 3x plus 2y plus 1. So this is going to be the same as having something like z equals 3x minus 2y plus 1. So because I only have a power of 1 on my z, on my x, and on my y, none of them are multiplied together, I have this linear degree 1 uh, equation here. And it's linear in x, y, and z. So that tells me that it's going to be the equation of a plane. And I can read off that normal vector if I want. So when we're thinking about that normal vector, we have to have the x, y, z all on the same sides. It doesn't matter where the constant is, but I need to subtract over that z. And now I can read off those coefficients, 3, negative 2, negative 1, as my uh, normal vector there. Down below, we have a z equals, right, we can think of this as z, the positive square root of x squared plus y squared. So we should recognize this as part of a cone. Because I have the square root there, but I don't have a plus or minus in front of it, it's implicitly always the positive version. So that just gives me the top half of that cone. So this graph is going to look something like this, where I get the top half of that cone. So let's say we're trying to graph functions that we haven't graphed before. We're going to use z traces, um, which are also called level curves, to help us. So we talked about these traces before um, in previous sections when we're going to let those variables be constant and see what we're going to get. And now we're going to just sort of use that to help us first graph familiar surfaces, and then we'll see how we can use them to help us picture new ones as well. So let's get started with that. Uh, we first want to look at f of xy equals the square root of x squared plus y squared. Right, this was that cone we just talked about. So we already have an idea of what that's going to look like. So let's see what its z traces or its level curves are going to look like. So what I need to do is to take this and just let my z or my f equal a constant and see what we get. So we're going to get that a constant is equal to square root of x squared plus y squared, or x squared plus y squared equals k squared. So I get that circle of radius k. And now I want to actually graph these circles for k values that are evenly spaced out. So I can start with k equals 1. That's going to give us a circle of radius 1. So I'll go out here to 1, draw a circle of radius 1, and label that k equals 1. Now when k equals 2, I get a circle of radius 2 squared. Well, sorry, I get x squared plus y squared equals 2 squared. So I get a circle of radius 2 at k equals 2. At k equals 3, I get a circle of radius 3. So my k values are spaced out, and my circles are evenly spaced out. Okay, so it says as we go out, the height is going up at a constant rate. And we should know that this shape here is a cone. So if I think about that cone shape here, it's just telling me that whenever I go out to a certain radius, I get a circle where the height is equal to that radius. So the height, this k value, is equal to the distance from the origin there. And that's why we get that straight up and down cone shape. Now let's compare that to this other function here. Perhaps you remember what the shape of that is, but we can go through and find that. So again, here we should have f of x and y, so let's just pop a little y in there. We're going to have that f of x and y equal a constant, or you can think of it as that being the z value equal a constant to get these traces or these level curves. So now I have x squared plus y squared equals k, and that still gives me a circle, but now the radius is going to be square root of k instead of k. So if I do the same thing here, 
if I start with k equals 1, well, the square root of 1 is just 1, so that gives me a circle of radius 1 at k equals 1. But then at k equals 2, I'm going to get a circle of radius root 2 at k equals 2, so that's a little closer in. At k equals 3, I'm going to get a circle of radius root 3, so that's still closer in here, k equals 3. And then let's put in k equals 4 as well. That's going to give me a circle of radius root 4, which is 2. So that's k equals 4. So I've got actually better pictures of these level curves drawn out. So let me go ahead and pop those in just so we can see it a little bit better. So I'm going to pull in my equations here. We've got this one and this one. So on the left there, we can see that we have those very evenly spaced curves for all my z values, z equals 1, z equals 2, z equals 3. The space between them is always constant, and that's because my height is going up at the same rate that I'm going away from that origin. Now, if you remember, this was a paraboloid. When we have that paraboloid shape, we're going to be going up at a faster and faster rate, which is why my level curves are getting closer and closer together. Because as we go out, it's getting steeper. So I'm going to go up to the next level, to the next height level, faster. I don't have to go as far, and that's why this is steeper here. So we can see that by looking at these level curves. And what we really think, kind of think of this as is something like a topographical map. So if you're used to looking at topographical maps, right, when those level curves are close to each other, when those contours are close to each other, that means that we're going to have sort of a steep curve. So let's look at that in the next slide. Here we have this topographical map of Acadia National Park. And I've highlighted some of those level curves, right, so we can kind of see these circular patterns. We have these little tiny circles right at the peak of mountains. Right, so this is going to be a really high elevation, an even higher elevation. This is sort of a lower elevation. Now this line over here, this is not one of those level curves. This is actually a trail that's on the map. But if I think about this trail, these lines here are my evenly spaced level curves. So when I go between some evenly spaced level curves really fast, that means the trail is going to be really steep there. Right, so uh, if we have another trail over here, it's going to be going along a level curve. So that means it's always going to be at basically the same elevation, so it's not going to be very steep. So this idea of level curves is just like this idea of a topographical map, where I can look at those different level curves, right, the places where the elevation is constant, and use that to help me understand what the overall shape looks like. One of the things that you'll be asked to do with these functions of several variables is to find their domain. Okay, so the domain is just your subset of R2, right? It's going to be some subset of R2 because I have two variables going in there of those allowable inputs, so the allowable x and y. So when we're doing this, it's sort of helpful to remember these basic uh, algebraic things um, that we can run, issues we can run into. So we have to know that we can't divide by 0. We can't take the square root, really any even root, of negatives. You can take the square root of 0 or the fourth root of 0, but not of negative numbers. You can't take the ln of negatives or 0. Sorry, this is an ln. Can I do it funny? And then there's also the inverse trig restrictions. Those come up a little bit less. These are sort of the big three. Okay, so let's look at this first example here. I'm trying to find the domain of f of, again, this should be x and y equals x cubed plus 2xy plus sine x. So x cubed can take in any value, x times y, there's no issues there. Sine x is allowed to take in any value. So I'm allowed to put in any x and any y. So my domain is all options for x and all options for y. So that's going to be R2. What about this next one here? 
for this next one, we see that we have a division. So I can't have x minus 2y equal to 0, which means x is not equal to 2y. So if I were to draw this out, I'm going to have this line, y equals x over 2, y equals x over 2. That's going to be the bad line. So my domain is anything except for that. So my domain is all of the stuff up here and all of the stuff down here, everywhere except for that line y equals x over 2. So how can I actually write this out? Maybe I can write it as r2. And then I'm going to get rid of, so we use a subtraction sign, the set of x, y that are bad. So such that x is equal to 2y. So we start with the good set, we throw out all the bad stuff, and that leaves our domain. So when we're doing the set builder notation, this is called, we're going to read this straight line as such that. So I'd call this the set of x, y, such that x is equal to 2y, and that's going to be subtracted or gotten rid of from the set of R2. So I get all of R2 except that line, and that'll be my domain. Let's do one more domain function here. So we're finding the domain of this function. Again, I see that I have a square root, and I have that division. So because of the square root, we know that the thing inside the square root has to be either greater than or equal to 0. But it also can't be equal to 0 because it's on the bottom. So together, I just have that x squared plus y squared is strictly greater than 0. Which means, sorry, I left my off my minus 4. Let's pop that in there which means x squared plus y squared is greater than or equal to 4. So if I think about what that looks like, again, I'm just drawing my domain, so I'm drawing it in R2. I have x squared plus y squared mm -hmm. equals 4 is, ooh, sorry, we said it couldn't equal 0. So let me get rid of that equals bit, strictly greater than 0. So this is strictly greater than 4. So maybe then I want to do a dotted line to designate that it can't actually equal. So I'll put in my axes. I'll draw that dotted line because I don't want to equal 4. Instead, I want to be greater than 4. So I should color in outside of that. So I should have all of this stuff outside of here as my domain. Let's do the best we can to kind of color that in. And we can also write this as the domain is the set of x, y, such that x squared plus y squared is strictly greater than 4. Finally, let's use our ideas of things like level curves and symmetries and things like that to try to match these functions with graphs. So what are the, some of the things I'm going to be looking for here? One thing I should recognize is that whenever I see an x squared plus y squared all together, that means that the function value is depending sort of on this x squared and y squared equaling some constant and not them individually, which means I'm going to have some sort of rotational symmetry. So that if I rotate around the axis, it doesn't matter what my x value and what my y value are, it really only matters how far away I am from the origin. So things like this function here have that rotational symmetry. Because if I'm a specific distance away from the origin, I get a specific function value. This one also appears to have that rotational symmetry. So we can see that the function value depends just on the distance from the origin. Although if we look down at the bottom, it looks like it's more of an oval than a circle. So maybe if I see something that has an elliptic shape, that would be good. And that's what I recognize here. I have that elliptic shape. So considering these two together, the first one right, has that sign, so it should have that oscillatory behavior. And it should oscillate 
as we're moving away from the origin. So I see, right, I'm oscillating as I'm moving out. So that first one should be B. Where this one down here, it has more of an oval shape because of that four in front of the Y squared. When X squared and Y squared are big, then I have a really small value, so it flattens out towards zero over the time. When they're small, then I'm gonna get a big value. So that one looks like F. Okay, so we were able to get that just from that rotational symmetry or that sort of elliptical symmetry. What else do we have going on here? Uh, maybe I look at this graph down here and I see that it has these sine waves going this way but also going this way. So I should have a sine or a cosine in both the x direction and in the y direction. So for this function here, I notice I have both that sine x and that sine y multiplied by each other. So when x is constant, I'm seeing a sine y. When y is constant, I'm seeing a sine x. So that's gonna look like that d there. Okay, so we've got this one, we've got this one, we've got this one. Let's see what we have left. The functions I have left are sine squared x plus a quarter y squared. One thing to notice about this is because this term is squared and this term is squared, it should be positive. So it should only have positive values. So it can't be a, which means it only can possibly be e or c. When x is constant, I should see something that looks like a constant plus a parabola, that y squared. So for a constant value of x, I should see that parabola. This one, when I have a constant value of x, I'm not seeing those parabolas. So that means this must be e. Okay, narrowing it down, I've got these two left. This one, again, has an x squared and a y squared, and then it's gonna have that e to the x squared, y squared. So as x squared plus y squared gets big, e to the negative x squared plus y squared gets small. So as I move out away from that z-axis, I should be getting really small. And I also notice that this is always positive because e is always positive and x squared and y squared are positive. So that one's gonna be C. It's always positive. And it's small as we move further away. Okay, so finally by process of an elimination, we can get that the last one must be A, but let's go through and actually think about why that makes sense. So we've got A for this guy. I notice that it's both positive and negative, depending on the sign of X. When x is constant, I'm going to get a constant minus 3 times a constant times y squared. So for constant values of x, I should see those parabolas. When y is constant, then I'm just seeing an x cubed minus 3x times a constant. So I'm seeing that cubic shape for y being constant, which is what I'm seeing that other way. So that's going to be my A there. So as we're doing these, right, by thinking about those different level curves, by thinking about symmetries, by thinking about positive and negative, about end behavior, we can do these sort of matchings.